Among the many decisions a digital forensics professional will make in their career, whether to pursue a graduate degree is among the biggest. Costs and time and sometimes money factor in, as well as how a degree could shape your future. Today, the Forensic Focus podcast welcomes Jade James. Our longtime readers might know her name from the product reviews she's written on our website, but for today, Jade, who is employed as a visiting university lecturer, is with us to talk about her brand new Master of Science degree in cybersecurity and forensics. I'm your podcast host, Krista Miller. Welcome, Jade. Hi. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm excited to learn more. I feel like um, I've been covering academia for the last uh, year or so, um, you know, research and so on, but I, I haven't really had much of an opportunity to talk to, you know, the people behind the research. So this is exciting for me. So, um, so I'll lead off with a question I ask most everyone. Um, tell us more about you, please. How did you first come to digital forensics? What made you decide this was the career for you? Okay, well, as a person, I am a single parent to a beautiful daughter. Um, professionally, right now, I'm currently a visiting lecturer at a university in the UK. And I guess my interest in computers in general, it literally stemmed from receiving my first personal computer in I'm going to say the year, it might make me sound really old. <laughs> <laughs> in 1999, that's when I got my first PC. And I was just so intrigued by it. And I wanted to know everything about it, the ins and outs, the different settings um, and the capabilities of it. And yeah, so that sort of like spawned my interest in computers in general. And then um, this may sound pretty cliche, but um, I was introduced to a certain program by my dad and that sort of spawned my love of forensics um, as I was completely blown away um, by this program. And it was just like, wow, this, this is what I want to do when I'm older. Um, Cause I was only 12 years old at the time. <laughs> and Can you say what the program was? Yeah, CSI. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's not cheesy that, at all. That's why, <laughs> yeah. that's why I was saying it was pretty cliche. But um, yeah, when I first saw that program, it was just amazing, like all the science behind it. Mm -hmm. And even though I was interested in the roles of like Catherine and Grissom as um, forensic scientists, um, my affections went more towards um, Archie in the lab, <laughs> in the audio visual lab and yeah. doing the technical stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's that's where my passion lied. <laughs> that's cool, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is sort of where my career in digital forensics actually started. <laughs> I um um I I have to admit as a writer I I really started writing fan fiction so I'm you know I mean that talk about cliche cheesy it's it's totally fine we all have to start somewhere <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so so walk us through your career thus far um you worked as a forensic analyst a quality manager in a lab um most recently a lecturer teaching university students as you've been pursuing this degree what led you along this particular career path. Yeah, so um, I completed my first degree, my bachelor's in 2013, and I was finding it quite difficult to get my foot into digital forensics, as um, it's pretty much a catch-22. They are always looking for people with experience, but then you can't get the experience without someone initially giving you that opportunity to gain that experience. So after my first degree, um it was quite difficult trying to get my foot in the door in regards to digital forensics so I attended a graduate week for um a forensic service provider and at the end of this graduate week they chose a select few to have an interview uh, for a graduate role and I was one of the select few that was chosen and at the end of it, it was between me and this other guy and um basically the guy was given the graduate role and that was due to he had more IT experience than I did mm -hmm. um so obviously feeling a bit defeated I went away 
Um, I got my IT job um, like they suggested I did. And then a few months later, um, I received a phone call from this company and they expressed an interest in um, having me in for another interview for the role. And yeah, so that's pretty much how I got into actually working for a, a digital forensics lab. And from there, I am really grateful for that opportunity because it gave me experience that I needed and which still helps me later on in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I gained a lot of transferable skills and it sort of put me on the radar. <laughs> yeah. I, became a bit, I became a bit of a commodity. Um, and I then I was told about an opportunity within a government agency in the UK and I went through the interview process with them as well and uh, fortunately I got the job which was it, again a, an amazing opportunity um, and within this role I was able to I had access to the latest digital forensics tools mm. and I was able to sort of um, gain experience knowledge with these tools and use them in a more research-based environment so I didn't work on live cases mm -hmm. um, which took a bit of the pressure off um, as working in digital forensics can be quite pressurized yeah. at times because you've always got multiple cases on the go mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so again, it was an opportunity for me to gain more experience and become more proficient in using digital forensics tools to their full capacity. And as well, um, I used to travel a lot within the UK and um, abroad actually to give um, advice and, and guidance to law enforcement agencies and police forces um, about certain tools or techniques which can be used to combat crime so yeah it was a really rewarding opportunity and then I guess due to personal circumstances I moved to a police force within um, London and I started working there as a quality manager uh, which was good because at the time um, police forces were going through ISO 17025 yes. accreditation. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of nice to help out from the other side, I guess. So not so much the technical, but more of the actual like documentation and the paperwork that goes behind the accreditation. Um, and yeah, it was good, but I sort of felt like I wanted to still be quite hands-on and to be more practical um, so when the opportunity arose I moved on to a more practical position mm -hmm. um, again I went back into the UK government and I worked for another government body and again it was a really good opportunity <laughs> um, this time I was working on live cases mm -hmm. and I got more experienced and more of an opportunity to go out in the field as well and actually attend um, searches and raids and actually um, help with the seizure of exhibits um, which would be brought back to the lab for us to analyse and then yeah so from then I I guess I'll get into it a bit later on um, but I sort of decided to take a sidestep in my career and focus a bit more on my studies. Um, so that's when I started my master's degree. And um, while studying my master's degree, I got involved with lecturing. Mm -hmm. So I became a visiting lecturer at one university in London, but more in a like, guest capacity. So I go in once an academic year and just give, um, a talk on the introduction of digital forensics to undergrad students on their forensic science degree and um, then I became more involved in the lecturing at another university outside of London um, in which I actually uh, deliver modules towards postgraduate and undergraduate degrees. Okay. 
so yeah that was a bit <laughs> a bit of my career path up until now it's really interesting just like um hearing about how you kind of made the different decisions to grow really as as a as a practitioner so yeah so in the context of that career path um what was important to you about earning a master's degree to begin with um so a master's degree is something I have contemplated uh, throughout the years from finishing my bachelor's degree anyway. I, I knew I wanted to do that, but it is sort of um, about time and funding as well. And within my um, employment, um, I was always sort of trying to get the funding within my employment um but it didn't work out that way so then I sort of decided to just take it upon myself um and just sort out the time and funding for myself I created the time and funding okay. um as well at the time I felt like my career was a bit stagnant mm -hmm. in digital forensics um and I felt like upping my game would help me move on in my career mm -hmm. um as I had been told on multiple occasions that I needed to be more technical because yeah I just seemed to be having trouble um getting a more senior role with okay. within digital forensics um and mm -hmm. I sort of started to realize that I do have the skills and I do have the knowledge. It's just, I needed to be more confident about myself and about my abilities. Um, but then I, I, I felt like the masters would help me with this anyway, because then I could, you know, say to people, you know, I am technical. I do have the skills. I do have the knowledge because, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to complete this masters. Mm -hmm. so. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that they, they wanted you to be more technical for senior roles, um, because um, in my experience, like usually they want more of the soft skills um, as opposed to the technical ones. So, yeah, so even though there were times where I was acting up to a more senior role, it just sort of it was all about qualifications and certifications oh, okay. as to like, you know, what what you know or and as well, it's quite hard, um, like progressing in digital forensics as well, as it is quite a male dominated field. And as a female, I have sort of like felt that it's quite difficult. So, yeah, I can imagine, too, as a single mother, that must be part of it. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll, I have a, another question for further on about um, challenges, so we can get to that in a bit. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to find out um, more first about how you went about pursuing the actual degree. Uh, what were your criteria for selecting a program? How did you arrive at those? And um, how did the University of Westminster fit? Yeah, so my master's journey um, commenced, again, it was due to personal circumstances. Um, I had suffered um, a very personal loss. Um, I suffered a miscarriage. Mm, sorry. And it's okay. Um, and it sort of just, I started reevaluating my priorities and just put things into perspective. And I just realized that um, at that time, I just I didn't want to do this anymore, and I I just wanted to spend more time with my child. Um, and like I mentioned before, I just felt like my career was a bit stagnant, so I just I decided that I just wanted to take a step back and to just reevaluate things. And um, but at the same time, I still wanted to be working towards something, and this is where I felt like it would be the perfect time for me now to do this masters to sort of like as well give me something to work towards because it, it didn't feel like I was yeah. working towards anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah um I think it was May 2019 that's when I actually started looking at um so if I'm going to do this masters where am I going to do it and so I started looking at different universities in London um and obviously like 
due to my personal circumstances as well like it needed to fit into my home life there needed to be like work-life balance um so I needed a university that was close to home and um who I guess would be sensitive to my situation and um the University of Westminster it just sort of jumped out of me because the course itself the course content it really attracted me as you know there was aspects of cyber security and digital forensics okay. yeah. um and because I guess I already have knowledge and experience in digital forensics mm-hmm. I thought it'd be interesting to actually learn more about cyber security yeah and this course was just the perfect mix of both because I, I was able to learn um, something new as in cybersecurity and then like refresh my knowledge and skills within digital forensics as well. And with the course at the University of Westminster, um, it also had the opportunity, you could either go down the cybersecurity path or the digital forensics path. Okay. And I chose the digital, di- digital forensics path um, but I actually got to take a module of the cybersecurity path. So again, it was it was just a really good mix of both. So yeah, okay. that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. So we talked a little bit before about um, challenges you faced on your career path, but I'm also curious about um, challenges uh, that you encountered and had to overcome in your studies um, over the last two years. I know um, probably the pandemic being number one, um, (laughs) but I'm I'm sure there were others. Um, How did you overcome them, Um, you know, whether the pandemic or or anything else that you encountered? Yeah, so... Actually, to be honest, quite early on, um, when I started my master's, I suffered another personal loss. Um, I suffered an ectopic pregnancy. Oh, wow. So this was my second loss in the same year, 2019. Oh, yeah. So at this point, I was pretty numb and, you know, like... I didn't even have time to grieve at this point because I just started the masters. Mm -hmm. Um, So it it did knock me back. And this is when I started deferring my assignments. And this meant that now um, a masters, which should have been one year turned into two years. Oh, okay. So already it was just like, oh, am I actually even gonna finish this? Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing? Like I should just give up now sort of thing. and then yeah, COVID hit, <laughs> which didn't help. Yeah. Um, but luckily, we had we had had all our like um, on campus teaching, so um, we wasn't actually due to attend campus um, for any of the modules, okay. uh, which was good. So yeah, it, it didn't really um, affect me in that way because I wasn't due to attend the university in person anyway um but it was quite difficult I guess accessing resources yeah um like I wasn't able to go to the library and get a textbook and I'm the kind of person that likes to have the textbooks out in front of me I don't like reading off the screen yeah yeah um but then I, I was able to um they were the library was able to post start posting me textbooks okay um, so one challenge but then also um with my daughter she um had to stay at home as well Mm -hmm. as the schools closed so which meant that I now had to homeschool my daughter as well as complete my master's assignments Mm -hmm. um so I literally just put my head down and just sort of focused on the two of us and I literally put together a timetable um, so between nine and three like Monday to Friday um, I would do studies with my daughter and then um, from six till nine p.m in the evenings that's when I would do my master's work mm-hmm. and yeah that was pretty much it for like a solid four to five months wow. of the first lockdown so yeah that was obviously <laughs> another challenge and the assignments itself as well um 
it was sort of a big jump from bachelor's to master's you know before I was dealing I, I was dealing with like 1000 to 2000 like word counts and now it's jumped up to like 5000 minimum yep. plus so <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of like whoa <laughs> as a journalist I sympathize <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like it, it's really hard to sort of you you just assume that people know what you're talking about so you just think I yeah. don't have to write as much because they already know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. but obviously you do need to explain yourself quite thoroughly yeah. um, to like achieve the marks that you need um, right yeah so yeah that was quite a few of of my challenges I encountered whilst studying. And those are big ones. I mean, I know, um, you know, as a writer, it sometimes feels like childcare and writing are two different sides of my brain and, um, you know, switching gears from one to the other can be very, very difficult. So I can only imagine, um, you know, being a single mom, how that must have gone for you. Yeah, so it was difficult because obviously, you know, there's always that guilt, like, yeah, um, I, I literally had to shut myself away in my bedroom because that's where I've set up my little office mm -hmm. and you know I had to explain to my daughter that between six and nine like please just do not disturb me because I really need to do my work like mommy needs to do her work mm -hmm. and she she totally understood and it was fine that's but awesome. there was still always that guilt oh yeah 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 I, I would always pop out and just be like you know you okay like mommy loves you so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I feel like it, it gives them an opportunity to step up as well, though, um, you know, being in a, in a household and um, sort of, I, I feel like they feel a little more responsible, but then again, minor teens. And so, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're, they're like looking for that extra responsibility as opposed to a younger one. So, um, yeah, well, my daughter was really, she was really supportive and there'll be times where if I, I was set myself, like, um, I need to do 500 words today. And, you know, I'd come out of my bedroom and she'd be like, did you do your 500 words? And I'd be like, yes, I did. And there was times where she would like make little posters for me saying like, congratulations, well done on completing Aww. the assignment. So. <laughs> no, that's chip. important though, right? I mean, um, you know, just to, to be in it sort of together. Yeah. Yeah. I was definitely in it together, just the two of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, did you have a master's thesis for, for this program? Yeah, so um, I wanted something that incorporated both aspects of cybersecurity and digital mm. forensics. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I felt like ransomware was where that happy medium was. Oh, okay, yep, yep. Um, so my, my dissertation, it was titled The Systematic Analysis of Ransomware Using Digital Forensics Tools. Um, Very cool. And the aim of the project was to just basically have a deeper knowledge um, and understanding of ransomware and digital forensics. Again, this project was quite personal to me because it wasn't necessarily like innovative. I, I didn't do anything new, um, but it was like a challenge I sort of set to myself and I just wanted to prove to other people that, um, yes, I am technical and I, I can do. <laughs> yeah. I can do these things. Um, so yeah, so uh, for my project, I set off into looking at ransomware. I looked at different types um, and, you know, I built virtual machines to execute uh, ransomware samples that I collected um, so I could examine their behavior. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if, if I did have more time or wanted to do further work, I wanted to sort of look at um, if it was possible to detect these sort of behaviors and um, to maybe try and stop them from occurring before you know um, encryption of files or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. happens takes place um so yeah that was that was pretty much it um i selected mm -hmm. different types of ransomware to use um in my analysis um for example i chose petia as one mm -hmm. of my samples because um, it made changes to the master boot record and the master file table as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as well because I was working in a virtual machine rather than um, like a cuckoo sandbox 
um, I thought I required a ransomware sample that didn't need communication with C2 servers. Mm -hmm. um, so I chose Petya. And then I chose WannaCry as well because um, in one of my previous assignments, we had to do um, like a really technical, detailed sort of journal article on WannaCry and um, the NHS attack in May 2017. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I just thought it would just be logical to continue with that because I already have knowledge of that attack and that ransomware. Okay, um, yep. So yeah, I used WannaCry as well. Mm -hmm. And as well, because it has similar properties um, to Petya as well. Um, for example, they both um, target Windows systems and as well, like um, I was only looking at Windows systems as opposed to like Apple yeah. or Linux. And then as well, I, I use Serbar because I needed something to compare the results as well. Um, because like, well, Petya com completely behaves differently to WannaCry so I needed something that was more similar to WannaCry um, okay. so I can sort of like you know have a means of comparison mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah that that was my thinking behind my dissertation it's interesting stuff I mean I know um it feels like um it, it's one of the more rapidly evolving uh areas of digital forensics yeah so well it's not even just in digital forensic cybersecurity. Sure. um ransomware is something that is seems to be happening more and more these days mm -hmm. um more organizations are falling victim to ransomware attacks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i think it is somewhat of an interesting um topic and i probably will continue to study it in more detail yeah yeah looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> so I want to flip a little bit. Um, so uh, so as as you've been earning your degree, you've also been teaching. Um, what was important to you about that? I know you mentioned earlier about um, being able to talk to students about um, about the digital forensics um, path. Is it, it's having been both a student and a lecturer, is there anything that stands out to you about the students that are in your classes, um, what's involved with teaching, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so yeah, with the lecturing, um, I was actually quite nervous when I first started it because I had just sort of, well, I was in the process of getting my master's myself. So I, yeah. I felt like a bit of a fraud. <laughs> like how, how, how can I stand there in front of all these students? and pretend to know <laughs> what I'm talking about when I haven't technically finished my master's myself. Mm. Um, so, and then I came across something called imp imposter syndrome as well. It's actually a real thing. <laughs> yep, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so actually completing successfully my master's obviously helped with that um, and gave me a bit of a boost that I needed in regards to my teaching. Um, and I definitely have become more confident with it. And I think it's important to, you need to have a passion to speak to these students and you need to show enthusiasm. Um, and I think you need that in general with digital friends anyway. I, I feel like it attracts a certain type of person you need to have a certain like frame of mind for it and it's definitely not for the light-hearted um but yeah so with the lecturing as well um it, it just seems it, it's definitely something that I was considering um probably later on in my career okay um but I'm happy to be doing it right now because obviously it's still valuable experience um but again, like I said, like I, I would like, I guess, more experience um, with practical, like hands-on, more practical roles to sort of help with my knowledge and experience so that I can, you know, pass that 
on to these students. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are, is there anything that stands out to you about the students like that are coming into your classes just in terms of like, um, I guess in, in context of your own experience, but also um, having worked in the field for the number of years that you have? Um, so for some reason, there seems to be an influx of international students, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. Um, I guess I can be a bit biased and say that the university I do work for is actually quite a good university. So I can imagine why we seem to be getting um, a higher intake each year. Um, and there definitely seems to be more of a passion and enthusiasm going into digital forensics mm. um, as the modules I teach towards the masters, I get a lot of the students actually ask me more about the digital forensics rather than the cybersecurity side of it. Hmm. Um, I've had quite a few students this week, actually, or <laughs> yesterday, I guess, um, coming up to me and asking me how um, I got into digital forensics and asking for advice on how they can pursue a career in it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, have you found it challenging to provide the kind of foundational knowledge that will car carry students through such a rapidly changing landscape or um, is it are there other kind of challenges with teaching in particular? Yeah, so um, obviously it, it's quite a difficult um, job to do and there is a lot of pressure on you to sort of, because um, everyone's looking at you like you have all the answers. And, you know, I, I do have my qualifications and my experience, but I wouldn't consider myself to be an expert. I don't know everything. Um, so I guess it's quite challenging to keep up. And, you know, it's for me to keep up with existing trends and, you know, knowledge, tools, techniques, so that I can give the correct information to the students. Mm -hmm um who I'm teaching and yeah like you said like it is so rapidly changing um it, it's very hard to keep up and I guess I find that you know as well as me teaching the students they also teach me a thing or two as well mm -hmm. um which I can go away and look at and learn about myself and then I can you know pass that knowledge on to the other students that I teach as well oh cool can you give an example of, of something like that? Yeah, I guess with teaching, it's, there is a bit of give and take. So as well as me teaching the students, um, I also learn a thing or two from them. <clears throat> so for example, I've just recently started teaching on um, a module which goes towards um, a bachelor's degree in computer science. And with this module is not stuff that I'm unfamiliar with, but I'm obviously unfamiliar with the, the course structure itself because I've come in at quite a late stage. So I've had to sort of hit the ground running and, you know, try and familiarize myself with the course content as much as possible. And the students are at a stage where they're having to do a practical assignment in ethical hacking and penetration testing. So, I'm obviously familiar with the concept of it and I'm able to conduct like pen testing myself but in regards to their assignment it's sort of I'm still trying to get my head around it so in the past couple of weeks I've literally been sitting with the students whilst they're going through their practical work and just asking them like oh so how do you do this or what do you need to do there and you know they've been happily just like showing me and we sort of um, like discovered artifacts together and things. And so it's actually been quite nice. And yeah. then obviously with that knowledge, I've then been able to pass it on to other students who are completing the same practical assignment and, um, you know, help them out. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when students are coming to you for advice on uh, either how to get started or um, I guess make a transition or just where to go with their careers, what advice do you give them? Um, and I mean, whether they're getting a new degree or they're moving, uh, transitioning from, from either a lab environment into uh, teaching or they're making some other transition in career in their career, uh, what are you telling them? Um, I get asked quite a lot, either through LinkedIn or you know, my university emails, I always get asked, you know, how, how can I work in digital forensics? Um, how can I pursue a career? Or, you know, do you think I should do a master's myself? Um, I guess in regards to gaining employment in digital forensics, I just basically try to say that um, perseverance is key. Like you just need to keep at it. Yeah. And, you know, you will probably encounter quite a lot of rejection because there's so many um, practitioners up against you for the same role it might sort of be disheartening to not get the role that you're trying to achieve um, it's not anything to do with your capabilities it's just the fact that you know there's so many people trying to get into the same yeah um, role as you so definitely perseverance is key you just need to keep going keep trying I advise them to maybe attend conferences and digital forensic mm -hmm. seminars because these are places in which you can um, pick up, you know, knowledge. You can learn about the latest tools, trends, techniques um, that are potentially used by criminals. Um, it's also a good place to do networking as well. Yeah. I, I think it's important to actually put yourself out there and sort of like make a name or face for yourself mm -hmm. because sometimes it, it's not even about what you know it's about who you know absolutely yeah and you know people will keep you in mind for future job opportunities as well because people like to work with like-minded people so yeah you know yes. if, if something comes up they may keep you in mind and like try and bring you in get you on the team so yeah, so things like, you know, uh, professional social media, such as LinkedIn, um, I advise that because it's a way of like sort of getting yourself out there. Um, I also advise like things like if, if it is possible, if you've done any work um, within digital forensics to maybe like write a paper about it and maybe um, publish it on ResearchGate mm -hmm. or some sort of medium where you could publish it again to sort of like just try and get yourself out there um and I do advocate in you know further education and it's definitely important to um upskill and to attain certifications mm -hmm. um either in specific tools or just you know digital forensics in general um and you know, I, I give advice on, you know, courses that I've attended in the past. And there's even conferences as well uh, in which you can attend and, you know, they offer training on them sometimes. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, like there's, there's different things you can do. And I just sort of say to people that there's no like set path. Right. It's, it's not a clear, you know, stepping stone path. It, it can vary it just depends on the person yeah for sure so final question um back to a more personal question uh what's next for you 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 had been um talking about wanting to um make sure that you're still getting practical experience to help with teaching so are you sticking with academia are you returning to forensic practice um still mixing both um what, what are your plans for the near future yeah so Right now, I'm I'm sort of I am sticking with academia. Um, I will continue lecturing, um, but I sort of see it as well. I'm I'm just taking a bit of a break, sure. a, a well deserved break. Um, from I guess you know going back into a lab environment. Um, I just want to sort of weigh up my options and see what I can do now where I can go from here um I, I would like to you know go back into full-time working 
um, within a digital forensics lab um, because I, I do feel it's important to have practical experience. Um, but yeah, right now I'm just, I guess, weighing up my options. Oh, I am interested as well in, in completing a PhD. Okay. Definitely. Excellent. But yeah, I just, I need to actually sit down and write my proposal for it. Um, but I'm, I'm not really sure what I want to study for the next three to five years of my life. So right. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not taking this decision too lightly. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, Jay, thank you again so much for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've, um, I've enjoyed hearing more about your experience and uh, how it informed your, your different roles and decisions. You're welcome. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcription along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.